We are continuing in our study through the Gospel of John, so if you would stand with me, open your Bibles to John 15. We'll read verses 9 through 17 and pray. John 15, 9 says, As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, than to lay down to one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for calling us through Jesus Christ, for loving us first, so that we might love you in return. We pray, Lord, that you would help our love uh, spill out to our brothers and sisters around us and indeed, Lord, to all the world, to be a witness unto Jesus and the glorious things that he offers. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you be seated? One of my favorite movies is The Princess Bride, and there's a great line from The Princess Bride. You guys are well familiar with when the, the character of Vizzini is amazed that this mysterious man in black is following him and just overcoming every obstacle that gets thrown at him, and he keeps saying, what, inconceivable. And so finally, you know, Inigo Montoya famously, utterly replies, you keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> Considering the way so many people treat the word love, Inigo Montoya may say the same thing to us. You keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. I'll take that off there. <laughs> Right? Because we use that word in so many different ways. We love our clothes, our cars, our phones, our food, or whatever. High schoolers, they love their boyfriends or girlfriends one week, you know, and then they just love someone else the next week. Some adults, unfortunately, treat their marriages the same way. We love our pets. We love our families. And for some people, they love their pets more than they love their families. And with all that in mind, in the same breath, we say we love God. With all of that, do we even know what the love of God truly is? And we see it many times that people even try to throw around the love of God like a club. You know, if you really love Jesus, then you would do X, Y, Z. You know, as if it's okay to be unloving in the way we're telling somebody else they're being unloving. Yeah. How do we sort through all of this? Well, thankfully, Jesus does it for us. Jesus tells us what his command is for us, and his command is for us to love. And he tells us how to go about it. We do it like he did. Now, keep in mind, much of this is not new. Much of what Jesus teaches here in chapter 15, 9 through 17 is what he's taught throughout the night with his disciples. Some of the things we've been looking at as we've been going through the Gospel of John is specifically here in the Upper Room Discourse. Ever since this group gathered together to celebrate the Passover, Jesus has been teaching them of his love for them, his desire for them to go do the same, and the power that he would give them to do so. Now, here he does the same thing. He's just introduced the final great I am statement of the gospel of John when he says, I am the true vine. And so this whole metaphor spoke of our dependency upon Jesus. We find our life in Christ. We bear fruit because of Christ, and we do all of this for the glory of God. Without him, we can do nothing. But of course, in him, we can do anything. And included in that is to love. Specifically, we can love like Jesus loved. This is his true commandment to us, and this is exactly what he equips us to do as we abide in him. This is love, as they would say in the Princess Bride, true love, right? <laughs> to love like Jesus. So let's dig into this. At verse 9, Jesus says, As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. This is one of those statements I think that it would be so easy to read over quickly as we're moving towards other verses, and if we do, we'll totally miss the gem of what it is Jesus is saying here. The overall point, of course, Jesus is making is that we need to love others like he loves us. It's imperative that we stay in Jesus, 
by saying in his love. That's the big picture, okay? But there's much that surrounds it. First is the depth of his love. How much does Jesus love us? He loves us more than we can imagine, more than it's possible to describe in terms of human relationships, even in the terms between husband and wife or the love between parent and child, human love falls short of the real extent of Jesus' love for us. And the only possible comparison that really can be made for the love of Christ for us is the love that God the Father has for God the Son. That's extreme love, superlative love. That's love beyond our imaginations. When my daughter was super little, I used to read a bedtime story, Marilyn and I both did, called Guess How Much I Love You, and these two rabbits were talking back and forth. You may be familiar with that. And of course, the, the parent rabbit's always outdoing the child rabbit. I love you to the moon. Well, I love you to the moon and back. Beyond what we can possibly imagine, this is how much Jesus loves us. Let's consider this for a minute. Jesus loves us like the Father loves him. How does the Father love the Son? He loves him infinitely. He loves the Son from eternity past. The Father has always loved the Son because they've always been in eternal relationship together. Now, we have not always existed, of course, but we have always been in the mind of Christ. The Bible says that God has loved us since before the foundation of the world. God the Father loves the Son into eternity future. God the Father never stops loving the Son. Even while Jesus bore the sins of mankind upon his shoulders at the cross, God never stopped loving him. Some mysterious way, he forsook Jesus, poured out his wrath on him, but he always loved him. He will always love him. Likewise, there'll never come a moment where Jesus stops loving us. He loved us enough to go to the cross for us. He'll continue to love us in eternity when he brings us to be with him where he is. There is no end of the love of God the Father for his son. We can say that the Father perfectly loves the son, and guess what that means? Jesus perfectly loves us. Christian, is there any greater news than that? You are beloved by God the Son and thus by God the Father, and you've always been loved by Him. Even before you knew Him and loved Him, He loved you first. To the disciples, Jesus speaking real time to the disciples, He spoke in basically the equivalent of our past tense. Right? He loved them. That was before he went to the cross, and already he loved his disciples. The cross was simply the demonstration of the love that had already existed for them. Jesus has always loved you, and he's loved us beyond what we can possibly conceive. Now, with that kind of love in mind, now what? Well, now we abide in that love. We stay in that love, dwell in that love. We abide in Jesus and the love that he has for us. Just as Jesus told the disciples to abide in him as branches abide in the vine, so are we to abide in the love of Christ. We think of it this way, love is our home. Love is our dwelling place. That's how we're to be known as Christians. That's just where we live. Now, what more could we possibly want other than the love of Christ? What can the world offer us in comparison to that? You know, when we put it in those terms and we think of all the sinful temptations we fall into from time to time, that stuff seems so trite, doesn't it? It seems so pathetic in comparison with the love of Jesus for us. Yet we go to those things so quickly. Why is that? Well, because we've temporarily lost sight of the grandness of the love of Jesus. If really we understood and got a glimpse of the love of Jesus at all times, what could that world possibly offer us? That would truly be tempting. It wouldn't draw us away. That's why we need to abide in his love. That's why we need to remain focused on his love for us. And that's why Paul prayed for the Ephesians, Ephesians 3, 17 through 19, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes all knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Know his love for you, and that will keep you going with everything else he wants you to do. So it's important to abide in the love of Christ. How do we do it? Jesus tells us in verse 10, if you will keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So how do we abide in love? Well, we obey Jesus. We keep his commandments. Wait a second. Objection. Isn't that legalism? You're telling me all of a sudden I'm supposed to obey whatever happened to grace. We're talking about love here. What about grace? Well, this is grace. There's no legalism in this. 
What's Jesus inviting us to do? He's inviting us to abide in his love. It's not like he's commanding something awful. Go talk, you know, uh, climb to the top of Mount Everest. Go crawl across broken glass. No, he's not telling us to do anything to earn his love. He's telling us how we will abide in his love. He's telling us what naturally happens as we abide in his love. We abide in his love when we keep his commandments. In other words, as we walk in obedience to Jesus, abiding in his love, that's just a natural outcome of all that. And what are his commandments? By the way, you might note plural here, commandments, more than one. There isn't just one. They're the same things he's been saying from the beginning. First, of course, is to love. The greatest of the commandments, as we've talked about the last several weeks, is what? To love the Lord our God with all our heart soul, mind, and strength. So we abide in the love of Christ by loving Christ. Well, that works out pretty well, doesn't it? We're staying in love the whole time. By the way, the second is what? To love our neighbor as ourselves. Thus, we abide in the love of Christ by loving others. This all makes sense. We share with the lost and dying world around us the compassionate message of the gospel. We show them how they can be saved from the wrath that's to come. That's the most loving thing we can possibly do with someone who's lost. And of course, it's not just our worldly neighbors that we love, but our brothers and sisters in Christ, which Jesus is going to address in a moment. Third, by the way, his command is to believe. Jesus told the multitudes that the work of God is to believe in him whom God had sent, John 6, 29. So we remain steadfast in our belief in Jesus Christ. We remain faithful in our faith. Is there anything else? Well, no doubt we could go through the Gospels with a fine-tooth comb and list out every single phrase that's put in an imperative that he gave his disciples and think of those as commands. But more likely than not, everything else is going to fall into these categories, right? How we deal with sin and temptation is wrapped up in how we love God because we're going to love God more than we love our sin. How we shine as lights of the world is wrapped up in our love for others. So between our love for God, our love for others, and our steadfast that steadfast faith in Christ, that pretty well sums up the commandments of our Lord. And again, this isn't legalism. To keep these commandments is a joyful thing. In fact, that's what Jesus is going to go on to address in the next verse. But before we get there, please note that Jesus does not tell the disciples to do anything that he himself did not do. Jesus said that he dwelled. He had his abode and the love of God the Father. How so? Through his own obedience to God. Jesus is himself fully God, but he did not exempt himself from obedience to God the Father. He willingly humbled himself unto God the Father, obeying everything that the Father had given him to do. That was no burden for Jesus. That was no attempt from Jesus to try to earn the love of his Father. Not at all. Jesus was always loved by the Father. It's only natural that Jesus would walk in obedience to him. It's the same way for us. Look at the command here, really starting verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, that your joy may be full. Before Jesus gets to the actual command himself, he gives a reason why he's saying any of this in the first place. This is a purpose statement, not just for this particular section of Scripture, but this is one of the purposes for the entire upper room discourse. Right? Why has Jesus been telling the disciples these things all night long? Well, because he wants them to have joy. Joy, think about that for a minute. Jesus is about to go to his suffering at the cross. He's hours away from being arrested and beaten and all the rest. Peter is about to deny knowing the Lord. All the disciples are about to be confused. There's going to come a time when Jesus is no longer physically among them at all, and yet he's told these things to them to have joy? Well, yes. Remember back at 14, verse 1, Jesus told them explicitly that he didn't want them to be troubled, but he doesn't stop with just having a lack of trouble. He wants them to go on to the fullness of his joy, completed joy, joy without lack, joy that's overflowing, real, true joy. See, this is what abiding in Christ leads to. This is what happens when we obey Jesus, keeping his commandments. This is what happens when we remain, dwell, live in his love. When we do, we experience the fullness of God's joy. Now, this isn't the paint a smile on your face and pretend everything's okay when I walk through the doors of the church sort of joy. right? This isn't a name it and claim it, I'll have it if I just believe hard enough, sort of forced joy. This is the joy that can only come from God no matter what our circumstances might be, sort of sincere joy. See, this is the stuff that the world promises but never delivers. 
This is the stuff everybody seeks after but has such a hard time finding. This is real, true joy. And guess what? Jesus wants you to be joyful. This is one of the major reasons Jesus was telling the disciples all of these things. He wanted them to have joy. He wanted them to have everlasting, completed, fulfilled joy. His desire for them is his desire for us. He wants us to have joy. Now, we might hear those words and just kind of balk a bit. We hesitate a bit because it just sounds too close to all the the TV preachers, right? They're claiming, oh, just believe it, you'll get health, wealth, and happiness. But we know God doesn't always give perfect health. We know God doesn't always give massive riches and a complete avoidance of sadness and trials. We know that. The book of Job is grand testimony to that fact, as are the lives of the apostles, as are our own personal experiences. By the way, as are the promises of Jesus himself, which is something he's going to go on to address in the next several verses in the Upper Room Discourse that very night. You're not exempt from trials. You will face them. But God does give joy. God doesn't promise us freedom from trials, but nowhere does God mandate that we be miserable in the midst of those trials. We can know true peace. We can know true joy even on our worst days. This is something that God promises his children. This is something that Jesus wants us to have. Okay, so how does the joy come? Well, by abiding in Christ. That's a whole context here. By abiding in his love, by keeping his commandments. And What is at least one of the commandments? Well, one of the commandments is to love. Look at verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. So obviously this isn't new, right? This is the same thing Jesus has been telling the disciples all night long. Throughout chapter 14, Jesus spoke of the need to love him by keeping his commandments, something that he's already repeated in this section here. But it went... Earlier than that this evening, after the Passover supper ended, what did he do? He washed the disciples' feet. That was a demonstration, an example of his love for the disciples, really looking forward to the cross. Uh, Chapter 13 goes on to tell us that when Judas left in order to betray Jesus, that's when Jesus gave what's called the new commandment to the disciples, and it was exactly what he says right here. John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is exactly what Jesus says here in chapter 15, verse 12, what he's going to go on to say in 15, verse 17. The need to love is imperative. It's not just an imperative, a command, but it's absolutely essential. It is essential to love as we walk as a disciple of Jesus Christ. It is the outward sign that we are indeed disciples of Jesus. See, even the pagan world around us understands that followers of Jesus are supposed to love one another. And the way we love one another is going to be evidence to them whether we take our faith seriously or we don't. Now, in chapter 13, Jesus called this a new commandment. In chapter 15, he doesn't. Of course, the idea that true worshipers of God are supposed to love, that's not really new. The entirety of the Old Testament, as we said, can be summed up in two commandments, to love God and love others. That was known, by the way, to the Jews of the day. One of the Pharisees and scribes was able to quote that back to Jesus in Luke chapter 10. It was emphasized by Jesus earlier in his ministry when he taught of the great commandments, Matthew 22. But what made it new that night, at least earlier that night in chapter 13, was the example and the standard of love. And so we see both in chapter 13 and chapter 15, Jesus describes that standard. He says, as I have loved you. As I have loved you. What's the standard of true Christian love? Jesus himself. Jesus set the example. Jesus is deserving of all glory in heaven and on earth, and yet what did he do? He temporarily laid aside that glory to come and dwell among us as God incarnate. By the way, don't forget that as we start to enter the Christmas season. That's the entire reason we celebrate Christmas. Not only did he give up his heavenly glory, he gave up even what little earthly comfort he had. He didn't have to come the way he did. He could have come as a wealthy king or landowner, but he didn't do any of that. He came in humble poverty with a singular purpose of entering into his suffering and the death on the cross. In his own words, Jesus said that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, Mark 10, 45. That is how Jesus loved them, and that's how they were to love one another. Well, what exactly does that look like for us? It looks like sacrifice. That's the whole point here of chapter 15, 13. 
Just in case anyone misappointed what Jesus meant by loving one another as he loved them, well, he spells it out. Greater love has no one than this, and they lay down his life for his friends. He was about to lay down his life for his disciples. So guess what? They're to lay down their lives for one another. And this makes such an impact on all the disciples, but especially as the Apostle John, he can't stop writing about this. Apostle John's known as the Apostle of Love, and he kept telling his own congregation members and the other church members that he encountered about this command of Christ. It's all throughout 1 John. It's like the overriding theme throughout the book. In chapter 3, verse 11, he said, the message that you've heard from the beginning is that we should love one another. In chapter 3, verse 14, he said, we know we've received life when we love the brethren, and says this, and exactly almost what Jesus says in 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. By the way, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It goes on throughout chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. That's what he keeps talking about. Notice the emphasis for the other believers in Christ. Yes, we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, and again, one of the best ways to love them is to share the gospel with them so they may be saved. But the new commandment of Christ does speak something of a little bit more specific. The emphasis here in our text and repeated by John the Apostle is the love that Christians are supposed to have for one another as Christians. We're to love one another. We're to love the brethren with the love with which Jesus loved us. Now keep in mind that kind of distinction isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just shows priority. We're going to love our own family members with a little bit more closer attention than we would with strangers that come off the street, right? It doesn't mean we're going to be rude or, or, or heartless towards strangers on the street, but we're going to treat our family members a little bit differently. Well, likewise, we're to love our brothers and sisters in Christ in a special way. How do we do it? By laying down our lives for them. By going to the furthest extent possible. Jesus loved us to the furthest extent when he died upon the cross for us. That's the standard. And when someone gives his life for another person, there's no doubt of the love the person had. Soldier's on a battlefield, and he lays down his life for the soldier who's fighting next to him or her. No doubt his love for his comrade. No doubt his love for his country. Well, it's the same thing here. When we lay down our lives for one another within the church, there's no doubt that we love the church like Jesus did. Now, practically, specifically, what does it look like? Well, it might look like the person who gives freely of his time to a guy who desperately needs counsel, or an older woman who comes alongside a younger woman to mentor her, to help raise her up in the things of God. It looks like the, the person who's going to buy groceries for you know, somebody he knows in the church that just is going hungry, or the guy who's doing yard work for the family next door who can't do it anymore. It looks like the people who serve faithfully in the children's ministry because they understand those kids need to understand the Word of God. Or the people who tirelessly forgive just because they themselves were forgiven. Or like the person who refuses to be offended in the first place just because they understand that that's the way we are. A sacrificial love. Sacrificial love can take all kinds of forms, and in all cases, it means laying aside our other priorities, our other comforts and desires, because the most important priority is to glorify God, especially in how we treat one another. Is it easy? No. But sacrifice never is. Jesus never once promised that love would be easy. He did say it was necessary. Where so many people run into problems is that they believe love is going to be easy. And by the way, I believe this is one reason why so many marriages fail. They believe love is supposed to be easy, and so they give up when things inevitably get difficult. True love involves sacrifice. Was it easy for Jesus to die on the cross for us? Of course not. Why would we think it'd be easy for us? It's not easy, but it's worthwhile. Jesus didn't lay down his life for us in love because it was a waste of time. No, he thought it was worth it. We were worth it because our salvation magnifies the glory of God. By the way, so does every act of love that we pour out on somebody else. It magnifies God. When Christians love like Christ loved us, it gives glory to God. So let us be those who glorify the Lord. Amen. By the way, don't miss what Jesus says here. Don't miss the gospel in this that Jesus lays down his life for us is at the core of our faith because Jesus is God who died for the sins we committed and rose from the grave and new resurrected life. Now all the world can be saved. That act of love is the good news of the gospel, right? That act of love is the reason why Jesus came. That's what purchased our salvation and ultimately writes every wrong that went, came forth in creation the Garden of Eden. 
Some people wonder, does Jesus really love me? All you got to do is look to the cross. That's the declaration of his love for you. We'll move on. Verse 14. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all things I've heard from my Father are made known to you. It's a little bit of an aside from Jesus' main point, but it's still related. Within the commandment to love one another, the standard was to lay down one's life for one's friends. And here it's like Jesus saying, oh, by the way, you're all men. I'm laying down my life for you. Well, how could they know? Well, that's an easy platitude to say. We hear it from politicians all the time. We're going to an election year. We're going to hear a lot of politicians say, my friends, my friends. Well, you don't know me from Adam. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you're my friend or not. Well, Jesus actually offers evidence that these disciples were his friends. How so? Well, he tells them his plans. He informed them of the things that he had heard from God the Father. Now, this is different than someone would treat a servant, or more accurately to the, the Greek here, a slave. Slaves aren't told by their masters what their master is going to be doing. They're just given commands and expected to obey. Friends, on the other hand, are informed of what's being done. Great picture of this between God and Abraham in Genesis 18, when God lets Abraham know what he's going to do with Sodom and the judgment that he's going to bring, and Abraham starts pleading and interceding on behalf of Sodom. The whole point is God is giving Abraham his mind, letting him know his plans, treating him as a friend. Well, for the disciples, this is true for them, both in their present time and ultimately in the future. In the present time, Jesus was currently letting them know what was going to go on. He was going to the cross. He'd be rising from the grave. He promised to return to them. He promised to send the helping Holy Spirit. Jesus had told them all those things that night and the nights leading up to that. He let them know his mind, his will, his plans. By the way, it was also true for the future. Jesus would share with them the most intimate aspects of the plans of God when he gave them his word. The Bible tells us and reveals to us the things of God. These things are what the disciples learned from Jesus and what the Holy Spirit would inspire them to write later on. And what the disciples were given, we have received. Christian, you've been given the mind of God. You are a friend of God. The moment you turned away from your sin and you put your faith in Jesus as Lord, what happened? God, the Holy Spirit, gave you a new birth. He gave you a new life, and he gave you something else. He gave you a new mind. Paul wrote to the Corinthians telling them that they were able to understand spiritual things because they had received the Holy Spirit. Now they had the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 13 through 16. Prior to receiving Jesus as our Lord, we couldn't understand those things, but now we can, now we do. That's true friendship with God. Now, before we go too much farther, we need to be careful not to take this where the Bible does not. Yes, Jesus calls his disciples and he calls us friends. It's true that he says that he no longer calls them slaves and servants, but that doesn't mean that they or we stop being his slaves and servants. After all, even in chapter 15, verse 20, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks, Jesus uses this term again in regards to his disciples. They and we, of course, will always be slaves of the Most High God by virtue of the fact that he is God. That will never change. He has bought us with the blood of his Son. We will always be his servants, but we are more than servants, more than slaves. We're also his friends. By the way, we're also his children. It's unique, but it's wonderful. Of course, that's not all what Jesus says about friendship with him. If you look back at verse 14, he also said, you are my friends if, if you do whatever I command you to. Not everyone who claims to be a friend of Jesus actually is a friend of Jesus. True friendship is going to be obvious. Someone who claims to be your friend but turns around and stabs you in the back is not really your friend. The way they treat you will be evidence of your friendship, likewise with Jesus. The evidence of our friendship with Jesus is our obedience to him. Again, this is part of our unique relationship. He is both our friend and our king. Thus, we love him and we obey him. Those two things just go hand in hand. As we saw earlier in the Upper Room Discourse, if we truly love Jesus, then we'll want to serve him, want to obey him. It's not how we earn our friendship, but it is evidence of it. So what happens when we obey Jesus by abiding in his love? What happens when we love others as he loved us? Well, we bear fruit. That's exactly what he desires for us. Look at verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. So we've been chosen by Jesus to bear fruit. Now we'll look at the aspect of choosing in just a moment, but don't miss the big picture. Remember back in verses 1 through 8, Jesus gave the metaphor of him being the vine and his disciples being the branches. As the branches, they were to abide in Christ the vine, drawing life from the vine. Why? 
It was to bear fruit. Throughout that section, to bear fruit. Six times in that passage, Jesus spoke of bearing fruit. Fruit is evidence of remaining in the vine. It's something that comes naturally for the branch. The branch doesn't have to work, labor to produce a fruit. It comes just because it's connected to the vine. Life is there. Here, Jesus hearkens back to that previous idea. Why love? Why obey? What's the point of those things? It's because Jesus desires us to bear fruit. See, God not only wants you to be joyful, he wants you to be fruitful. What's the fruit? It's the same thing Jesus has been talking about this entire time. It's love. The disciples are to abide in love, to love others, and to produce the love of Christ in their life. Talking about life transformation. This is us becoming more and more into the men and women that God desires us to be. This is our character being molded and shaped into the image of Christ. Practically speaking, this looks like us sacrificially laying down our lives for one another in the church. It's us looking upon the lost world with compassion and both demonstrating and declaring God's love for them in the gospel. It's us walking in joyful obedience to the things that Jesus has commanded us. All those things, the fruit that God desires to produce in us isn't just one of those things, it's all of those things. Remember, no grape producer wants a vine to just pop out one little bitty grape. No, he wants a bunch of grapes. In fact, he wants a bunch of bunches of grapes, doesn't he? Well, God wants us, verse 8 of chapter 15, to bear what? Much fruit. He wants us to be abundantly fruitful. How is it that we bear fruit? It comes through abiding in Christ. Thus, abiding in his love. But you know, ultimately, it's more foundational than that. It comes because it's the choice of God. To the disciples, Jesus reminds them that it wasn't the disciples who came to Jesus asking to be made disciples. No, Jesus is the one who found them and said to each of them, follow me. And you might remember he went up on the mountain to pray, and he then called the twelve to be his disciples, specifically setting them apart from the rest of the multitudes that followed him. Jesus had a plan in his choosing, and of course at this point each of the remaining eleven would go and bear fruit that would last. Ultimately, what would they do? They'd lay the foundation for the church Jesus was building, and that fruit has lasted for a long time. It's seeing it even still today, right? Into eternity. Of course, there are spiritual principles at work here as well. Jesus specifically chose the 12 as his apostles. The same can be said of the rest of us as his followers. First, Jesus chose us. He knew us and he chose us to receive the free gift of salvation. Now, does that contradict our free will and asking to be saved? Not according to the Bible, it doesn't. Does it mean that the salvation of Jesus is not available to all the world? Not according to the Bible, it doesn't. It may be a mystery how it all works together, but there's no doubt that Jesus did actively use his choice in making us his disciples. People fret and debate. There's not something to fret over. There's something to rejoice in. If you're a Christian, God chose you. Praise God. God chose you, but God chose you to bear fruit. He didn't save us so that we could sit around. We mentioned it before. He doesn't want a bunch of spiritual couch potatoes as a vegetable. He wants fruit, fruitful disciples. He saved us for a purpose so that we could glorify God, being used by him as we abide in Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. See, God has a plan for you. We are to be active participants in it. Not only did God choose you, God chose you to bear fruit. God chose you to bear enduring fruit. One of the problems with fruit, physical fruit, is so quickly decays. We buy bananas, and it's not, you know, five minutes after we bring them home, there's brown spots all over them. The fruit that Jesus will produce in us will last. It will remain. You know, this word remain is the same root word Jesus has used throughout this passage in talking about abiding in him, dwelling in him. How long is that supposed to last? Eternity. How long will the fruit of our discipleship last that he produces into eternity? Now, keep in mind, this is something that we can ask for. In fact, this is something we should ask for. Jesus speaks of it in the context of prayer. And repeats her for the third time during this upper room discourse how God will give the disciples anything that they ask for in his name. So think about it this way. One prayer that is absolutely guaranteed to be answered by God is a prayer to him that we would bear fruit. Are you having trouble loving others? Ask God. He will help you. Do you need help forgiving? Ask God. He will help you. Do you need courage sharing your faith? I guarantee you, God will help you in that. These are things God desires for us. These are all ways we can be fruitful for Christ. These are things that God desires to do in our lives. He wants us to be fruitful, so he will help us be so. So ask. 
Too many times, too many Christians walk around as if we're helpless to be anything except the way that we currently are, and that's not so. God wants us to be fruitful. God is truly available to us as a father is to his children. All we need to do is ask. It's verse 17, he sums it up. These things I command you that you love one another. You know, this is the third time Jesus has given this commandment. It ought to underscore its importance. And when God says anything once, it's important. He repeats it two more times. <laughs> it's essential. Love one another. Sacrifice for one another. Lay down your lives for one another. Love one another as Jesus has loved us. This is his commandment, and this is our duty. This is our joy. By the way, not only does this repetition emphasize its importance, but it also demonstrates our negligence. Because why should Jesus need to say it so many times? Well, because we need it to have it said to us. When offenses come, you know, it's rare that our very first response is to love the person who offended us. Usually our first response is to raise up our self-defenses, dig in, and respond in like manner. We need to be told, love one another. When it's hardest to love is often when it's most necessary. Think of a moment of the people in your life who is it that immediately pops to mind that you have the most difficulty loving? And yes, that list could include other Christians. If we're being honest, sometimes it's more difficult to love Christians the way we ought because we think that the Christian ought to know better. And they should, but so should we. Love them. Extend to them the grace that you want extended to you. Sacrifice for them the way you know that Jesus has sacrificed for you. That's the love that Jesus desires for all of his followers, and that's the love that Jesus wants to develop within you. Our commandment, guys, is to love. Love others like Jesus loved us. To love like Jesus is to obey Jesus, is to keep his commands, and is to abide in Christ himself. Who is there in your life that needs to know the love of Jesus? In what ways is God calling you to lay down your own comforts in order to sacrifice for and love someone else. The love of Jesus is not supposed to be theoretical in the life of a Christian. It's supposed to be practical. It's something that needs to be expressed. May we be those who express and live out the love of Christ. And where we lack knowledge, ask. Where we lack the courage, ask. God desires us to be fruitful. He will empower us to be fruitful. And as we act in love, it will be a joy. There's no joy like that Joy that's knowing we're precisely in the will of God. And God wants you to experience that joy, and you will when you love like Jesus. Now, maybe you're here today and you're reminded of some ways that you failed to demonstrate the love of Jesus. You got an opportunity to ask for forgiveness, be cleansed from that, and have more opportunities to do so again. He gives us those opportunities every day. We just need to ask him to open our minds or open our eyes to those things that he brings in front of us. But maybe today is the day that you need to first respond to the love of Christ. God does love you and his desire for you is so you will be saved, be made his child through repentance and faith in Jesus. And that can happen to anyone today. But you have to respond to his offer. And you have the opportunity to do that right now as we pray. Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus and this incredible act of love to die for us at the cross, to pay the punishment for all of our sins, all those things that we did, Jesus died for. And now we can be forgiven when we turn to him in faith. Lord, I do pray for those among us right now who need to do that, who need to respond to Jesus, asking, Lord, I know the things that I've done Please forgive me. Please make me your child. Please save me and make me the person you want me to be. Lord, you know how they want to pour out their heart to you. Help them do so in their words right now. Help them respond to your grace. Help them respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit right now, asking to be saved. Lord, for the rest of us, as we think of how you loved us, help us be diligent in showing that towards one another. 
Help us be active and looking for opportunities to be used to demonstrate the love of Christ to one another. Lord, we don't want to be passive in this. We want to be active. We want to be used by you as we abide in you and give you glory. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the forgiveness that you offer us in the cross. We thank you for the life that we received. Thank you for making us your friends and your children. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.